am Sister Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums, and I am a queer Black troublemaker, Black feminist love evangelist, aspirational favorite cousin to everyone listening, and I am writing a biography of Audre Lorde called The Eternal Life of Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde is the best known, out, proud, boundary breaking, black, lesbian, feminist poet of our contemporary times. And she, every time she introduced herself, she would say, I am a black, lesbian, feminist, warrior, poet socialist mother and she would name her multiplicity because it was important to her that she loved every part of who she was and she was born in the mid-1930s in Harlem, New York at a time in which loving all of who she was didn't even seem possible and even the people who she knew or who mentored her, Langston Hughes included, did not have the space to name all of who they were. So it was very important to her that she do that every single time she showed up somewhere. Audre Lorde was the New York State Poet Laureate. She was a um, teacher in the City University of New York system for many years. She, she taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. She was that I know of, the first person to teach about systemic racism, specifically to classrooms filled with police officers who were like on duty working police officers. She also taught poetry at Hunter College for many years. And she lived in New York City for most of her life, but at the end of her life, she moved to St. Croix in the Caribbean. And that was really important to her too, because she is of Caribbean ancestry. Her mother was from Grenada and her father was from Barbados. So I could obviously talk about Audre Lorde forever because she, well, I'm writing a whole biography about her and, and I'll never run out of things to say about her, but she has inspired me since I was 14 years old to understand that I can love every part of who I am. And she has been a life-saving force, especially for queer people of color for decades and now multiple generations. Well, when I was 14, which is the same time that I met dear beloved brother Charles, <laughs> I was part of a writing group at Karis Feminist Bookstore in Atlanta, Georgia. They had a young writers group and Basically, they didn't have a whole bunch of programming space in this bookstore. So where we met was kind of a storage closet. Um, so we were in there with our chairs and our journals doing our writing, but there were stacks of books all around us. And I remember the stacks of the purple collected poems of Audre Lorde. This is my copy I've had since then. You see it's falling apart. Um, these were stacked in there. And then the blue copies of Sister Outsider, Audre Lorde's um, first book of essays was also in there. And that was really how I first came to her was like, what is this? And who is this? And once I got this copy of, um, oh, I have my sister outsider right here too. You see, I keep them at hand. You know what I'm saying? Like when you have sacred texts, it's like, I just need to always be able to reach out and hold on to Audrey. So everything I wrote, for my high school English papers, I would have either epigraph from Audre Lorde or an epigraph from James Baldwin, who was also blowing my mind at the same time. And I remember totally defacing the uh, window treatments in my bedroom with Sharpie markers. And I had a quote from Cole by Audre Lorde. And I had another quote from James Baldwin there. And 
I think what I intuited without being able to describe it at that age is that these ancestors were holding space for me. And I didn't know, you know, I was a late bloomer. I didn't know anything about my sexuality at that time, at that age yet. But I knew that these writers were important to me and I just allowed them to open the doors. You know, like when I wrote an epigraph from Audre Lorde or James Baldwin at the top of an essay, it was like, they said what they said, which makes space for me to say what I need to say, right? Um, and by having their like words huge in my bedroom, it was like, this is actually where I come from, right? This this is my lineage. And I wouldn't I wouldn't have had those words at the time, but I absolutely had that I at least could trust that desire that I had to be inside of the worlds they were creating. There's so much, there's so much there. And I remember being so happy. And I remember also emailing Charles when I got to visit the Black Gay and Lesbian Archives at the Schomburg Center, which Stephen G. Fullwood created. And he also helped me to get a research fellowship that allowed me to be sitting in there with these letters. And it was just like a love fest. When I talk about love fest, it was so beautiful to see, you know, Joseph Beam was writing to Audre Lorde and saying, you know, thank you for helping me feel possible. And reading your work has made me know that I could do my own work. And I love what you're doing around Black feminism. And I really want to bring that into the work that I'm doing with Black gay men. And just, it was like over and over again, the gratitude that Joseph Beam would express to Audre Lorde and also to Barbara Smith, who, you know, Barbara Smith considered Joseph Beam to be her soulmate, you know, her platonic soulmate, such a close brother comrade. And he really felt like what they did in terms of Black feminist publishing from a Black lesbian feminist perspective made him know that what he longed for, which was a space of home, a space where Black gay men could love each other and be themselves and offer the contribution of their brilliance to the Black community as a whole, it made him know that that was possible. And so there was all of this love, but there was also like specific things like, so how did you get your publishing contract? And, you know, what should I do when... Allison Press, which was who they were working with at the time, pushed back about this and how I want to spell black and, you know, all of the all of the nitty gritty things, but also the big expansive things. Right. So and Audre Lorde, I mean, it was so mutual. So Audre Lorde was just like so grateful. And this is a thing that even now, having done the research that I've done for this biography, I understand even more that. Audre Lorde was as interested in a new model of Black masculinity as Joseph Beam and Essex Hemphill were. And part of that was because she saw her father as an emotionally repressed person. She believed that that emotional repression led to his early death. He, he had terrible, terrible blood pressure. He died because of multiple strokes only in his 50s. And she was actually terrified when she thought about her son growing up into a model of Black masculinity that was didn't have any space for him to exist or be himself or feel his emotions or truly love himself. And it was the work of Joseph Beam and Essex Hemphill that showed her that actually it's possible to be a Black man and to love yourself and to believe in freedom and to make space for expression, right? She was so inspired by that work and, and she said it over and over again. Thank you for being in my world. Thank you for being in my son's world. You know, she would, she would explicitly talk about how it was a paradigm shift for her to, because she always hoped, of course, that Black men could be free. And this is part of why she's fighting for liberation. But until she actually saw the work that Joseph Beam and Essex Hemphill were doing, she hadn't had the experience of really witnessing it, 
in a way that inspired and resonated for her. So it was such a mutual love fest back and forth. And I love those letters because it's, it's a model for how often, you know, black lesbian community and black gay male community are considered to be these different communities. And in fact, what the archive shows is not only was there all of this mutual admiration and love, but there was so much collaboration. You know, Michelle Parkerson was one of Essex Temple's major collaboration collaborators in Washington, DC, right? And and um there was always this understanding that we could recognize each other because the world that we want to be free in is the same world. And yeah, it came it came from a deep black love and a dream of liberation that I think they really saw reflected in each other. I can also say that Essex Hemphill and Audre Lorde didn't get, didn't communicate as much as Essex as Essex Hemphill and Joseph Beam for sure, but also not as much as Audre Lorde and Joseph Beam. And but Essex Hemphill first saw Audre Lorde read her poem "Power," which is a poem that she wrote um, in response to an act of police murder of a child in in her community in New York City, and. Essex Hemphill was in college and his professor had taken them to Howard University for the Black Writers Conference and Audre Lorde offered this poem and Essex Hemphill was like, he felt it in his whole being and he never forgot it. And he was so inspired because for him, it reflected the type of truth telling that was his calling and that was his mission. And of course, if you look at Essex Hemphill's poetry, First of all, he he definitely responds to police violence and surveillance and also the murders of black gay men in the DC area and everything, right? I mean, he he um is one of our bravest and boldest prophets because there was nothing that he would not challenge himself to tell the truth about, even his own internal truths. And that's one of the things that I admire about him so much. That's definitely something that Audre Lorde loved about his work. And they got to present together at the first, so there, there was an initiative called Art Against Apartheid that was protesting the apartheid system in South Africa. And it was a you know global movement and it was a fundraising strategy for artists to say, okay, we're gonna donate our paintings, we're gonna do poetry readings, we're gonna make anthologies, all of it to support the effort to end apartheid. The first Arts Against Apartheid event that was sponsored by lesbian and gay organizations was at Hunter College and Essex Hemphill and Audre Lorde, both were the featured poets at that event. And Essex Hemphill talks about it like he was beside himself. Because remember, he is, he's a college student. He sees Audre Lorde. He's like, whoa, this is like so inspiring. He never forgets it. And he actually shared that that night from the stage. But also, I mean, and this is mysterious, but it's what's cool is that the um, somebody recorded that whole event. So I've listened to it over and over again because, you know, I'm obsessed. And he says he was so nervous because he admired Audre Lorde so much that he literally like got sick, like ran from the stage and like threw up in a trash can and came back onto the stage and um, and delivered his poetry like to, to like standing ovation and everybody loved it and you know, all of that. But he said in a letter to Audre Lorde that he was so nervous that he literally got physically ill because he admired her so much. Now, I think there may have been some food poisoning involved. Anyway, I don't know if it was all just how much he admired Audre Lorde because you know, but, um, but for him, that's how he described it. Like he admired her to the moon. And, and, you know, when I've been interviewing people about Audre Lorde, she, I mean, like white lesbian feminists were like, yeah, Audre Lorde would be like, we have to support Essex Hemphill and what he's doing. And she was the one who articulated, she was like, this is a feminist issue. Supporting this brother to tell the truth that he's telling should be a feminist imperative, right? And she's remembered for that, you know, for, and, and um, one of the last letters that she wrote to Adrian Rich, 
a lesbian feminist poet, a white lesbian feminist poet who was a close friend of Audre Lorde. And um, they collaborated and they sent poems back and forth and they had a, a lifelong friendship. And in what I think is actually her last letter to Adrian Rich, she talks about how the poetry f- by Essex Temple is like, li- she said, I'm carrying it inside me wherever I go. And this was like two months before she passed away. She's thinking about Essex Temple's poetry. And in fact, it's really right after Ceremonies has come out. And it was so important to her that she already lived in St. Croix. Her daughter, Elizabeth, went and bought the book and made sure she shipped it directly to St. Croix so her mother could read it before she passed, right? They didn't know how much time she even had left. And her love and identification with and value of Essex Temple's work was such that she had, she had to have her own copy of Ceremonies and she read it right away and she internalized it, right? She talked about it becoming a part of her that she then carried into the, into the infinite, right? And um, out, of, out of this lifetime with her. So that's to say there really is no way to overstate the love exchange <laughs> in those relationships. Like it, it really, I, I can't, it, it's, I can't make it up. You know, it's, it's like if I were to try to describe it in more extreme terms, there really aren't more extreme terms than, you know, the gratitude talking about, I put this on my kids talking about, this is this is my dying wish to read this book. Talking about I'm gonna be physically ill. I'm so excited to even be near you. You know, it 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 sounds like the type of hyperbole that I would try to make up to describe the love that I feel, except the, <laughs> it's in the archive, all this stuff really happened. So um so yeah, it it's deep, deep, deep love and commitment and reflection and mutual, mutual liberation. I really think that knowing each other, knowing about each other, supporting each other's work, witnessing each other's work, they allowed themselves to be freed by each other in a way that could only happen from this particular vantage point and with this, with this openness, this open heartedness that they showed towards each other. So in 1992, and so this is, this is also the year that Audre Lorde passes away. Um, by 1992, you know, our community had been completely decimated already by the HIV AIDS epidemic. And Melvin Dixon is one of the keynote speakers at the Outright Conference that year, 1992, and an Outright is the premier gathering for lesbian and gay writers at the time. And so it's a big deal that Melvin Dixon is a keynote speaker. Melvin Dixon has been instrumental to the existence of a lesbian and gay literary movement, in particular a black gay and lesbian movement as a novelist, as a poet, and as a really real advocate for publishing. And so we all have benefited from the work that he did. Now by 1992, his partner has already died of AIDS and he has documented some of that in his poetry and his witness and his heartbreak and he is dying. And he knows that this speech that he's giving at Outright maybe one of the last things that he ever does. It does end up being his last public speech. And he is cognizant of that. And it's like he's close to the veil between life and death. And he opens this portal through his keynote at Outright to understand that there has to be an ancestral source of reverence and reciprocity that will continue to support this movement that he's been a part of birthing. And so he 
doesn't think he's going to be at the next outright conference. He doesn't think that he's going to get to see, you know, these anthologies and these books and these publishing initiatives that he's helped start. He's not going to get to see the results during this lifetime. And so he models his keynote based on this spiritual in the Black church tradition, I'll be somewhere listening for my name, right? And it's this hymn that, you know, when I think about it, everybody of all ages sings it, of course, but I think about the elders singing it and they're singing it because they know they're going to be the ancestors soon. And that on the other side, when they're up in heaven, they're going to be listening for our reverence and honoring of them and and we and that we can call on them for ancestral support, right? It's one of the ways that this syncretism and this ancestral reverence inside of a Black Christian framework just flows together and has been kept alive in our community. So this is what Melvin Dixon draws on. He draws on that tradition that he knows he's going to be an ancestor soon and that he's still going to be with us, though, as part of this movement at that time. And so he ends his speech with these powerful words, and I'm so glad it was recorded so that we can hear him saying it and that you know folks can, can listen to it online. But he says, you, by the possibility of your good health and the broadness of your vision, are charged to remember us. And I get, I get teared up every time I repeat that because the you that he's talking about, yes, it's the people who were there at the conference, of course, who are still doing amazing work, many of them. But it's also us, you know, some of us who were, I, I was a little child in 1992 and I wouldn't have been anywhere near a conference of any type. But, and some people who weren't even born yet, we are charged to remember him and to remember all of those ancestors who offered their lives in the service of a movement that would affirm us, honor us, liberate us, and very importantly to Melvin Dixon and to these other figures, Audre Lorde, Barbara Smith, Joseph Bean, Essex Hemphill, put our tradition in print so that when we needed it, we would be able to find it, like literally be able to open up in the life and read the words, black love, black men loving black men is the revolutionary act. You know, like we would actually not have to feel like we were making that up ourselves. We would not have to feel the way that they often felt that, that we were the only ones and the first ones, but we would have something that they left as an act of love for us. And so we must remember them, right? And that Melvin Dixon and that whole multitude of ancestors is there listening for their name, listening for us to call the names Melvin Dixon, Joseph Beam, Audre Lorde, Essex Hemphill, because their energy is continuing to circulate with our energy and to support us and to guide us of what we should do for those who are going to come after us. They are absolutely always in every moment a part of what we're doing. And they called us to this. And I think it's so important because when, you know, this, this is the sacred energy of Black queer love, in my view. When the foundations don't get it, when the publishing industry is being shady, when it's out of style, for us to love each other <laughs> with this deep black love. We remember that we have been called by these ancestors who are still supporting us to this work. And that's why we do it, right? We do it because we were called by them and we do it like they did it for those who we don't even know yet will need this work that we're doing. And there is nothing stronger than that. There is nothing that can erase that. There is no one and nothing that can ever take that away from us. And yeah, that's why I'm so moved. Obviously I'm here preaching <laughs> because I, I believe in this so strongly, but for me, this is why I wake up in the morning. You know, I feel that everything that I do in the course of the day 
is part of this tradition. And that's what makes it meaningful. And that's what makes it possible in the first place. So yes, that is the portal that Melvin Dixon opened during his speech at Outright 92. And it is a portal that we keep open with our practice and our reverence and our love and our continuing affirmation that we love you, Melvin Dixon. We are calling your name. Yes, please find me. Please keep in touch with me. My website is alexispauline.com and that's where you can see new things that I write and what I've ever done and um, immersive online portals that I open so that folks can learn about our history. And at Alexis Pauline is my handle for Twitter and for Instagram. So you can find me there too. I would love, love, love to be in touch and to hear about all the miracles that folks who are listening to this are making happen. <laughs>